can start recording. Perfect. So welcome everyone. And I'm my name is Michelle Dubinsky. I am representing the Institute of Medical Science. And here we have Miss Hazel Pollard, who is the most perfect person to be here as she will be able to answer all of your questions as the IMS admissions officer. So today we're going to talk about graduate program admissions into the IMS. If my slides would go forward, that would be great. I don't know why. Here we go. So just quickly, we have our leadership team and Dr. Ming Yao Liu, our director, has actually gone on um, an administrative leave for now. So Dr. Lucy, Lucy Osborne, our graduate coordinator, is the interim director of the program, but we have a great team of staff or of faculty, sorry, for all of the different departments um, and committees that are part of our institute. Then we have a full team of staff members. As I mentioned, Ms. Pollard, who is on the left, is the most important person as she is our admissions officer. And so any questions you may have can go to her and I'll supply her email address at the end of the session. So thinking about at the SGS or the School of Graduate Studies like an umbrella, we have a ton of different departments within this umbrella. So IMS, the Institute of Medical Sciences, is just one of these graduate departments in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine. We are actually the largest graduate department. We have about 600 faculty members and 500 students at present. So we are quite large and we encompass many, many different research areas within our institute. So here are some unique characteristics of the IMS. We're large, as I mentioned, the largest unit in the SGS Life Sciences Division. And we pride ourselves on bench to bedside research. What this means is that we have translational research going from the bench, the lab bench, to the bedside of patients. So we have basic science with links to disease mechanisms all the way through to clinical science and clinical applications. We are considered an institute without walls because students and faculty are widely dispersed across U of T as well as affiliated hospital research institutes. So we don't have just one building, we are the entire city of Toronto with many teaching hospitals. So IMS students are mainly affiliated with teaching hospitals and here's a list of quite a few of them. I'd like to point out Hospital for Sick Children as a world renowned hospital and research institution all the way from that type of research to CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and everything in between. So all of the teaching hospitals in the city are affiliated with our program, which is very exciting, especially because we can um, have students doing any type of research that's out there. So what do we offer? We offer an academic stream program, so a master's of science or a PhD. These are thesis-based graduate degrees in medical science. And these degrees have a strong emphasis on research. We are course light in that you do few courses in the IMS because your main focus is your research. Again, as I mentioned before, we have a wide range of research areas from clinical to basic medical science and all of the fields in between. So here are just a few of our many faculty members, and I want to highlight Dr. Mohamed Mamdani, who's the director of the Temerdi Center for AI in Medicine. AI in Medicine has become a huge field and is so interesting, especially because there's a lot of big data that we can use through hospitals, as well as within the city of Toronto. Another um, person I would like to highlight is Dr. Aisha Lofters, and she's the Chair in Implementation Science at the Peter Gilgan Center for Women's Cancers, and um, as well as Health Promotion and Equity in Women's Health. So these are just to name a few. Also, Dr. Morshead, who just spoke to you, is an IMS faculty member as well. So we have, you know, from the AI in medicine to women's health, to regenerative medicine and stem cells as well. So Dr. Morshead just spoke to you and she is also an IMS faculty member. So I'm going to bring that up as well. Now, who are our students? So I mentioned our faculty, but we have quite a few accomplished students as well. So 14% of our student body are licensed MDs. 16% are international MDs. So these are medical doctors trained in the MD program, either in Canada or internationally, whereas 70% of our students have a bachelor's of science or a master's of science graduate, and they have no health professional training. 
So they do have just motivation, are academically accomplished and have a passion for exploration. Ideally, we like to see that our students have some research experience. So I'm gonna go back to the ANA 498. That's a great way to show you're interested in the IMS by having done a research project in your undergraduate studies. So you can definitely do that course, find someone, a research lab you're interested in, and you can continue on into the IMS after that. So the IMS not only prepares you for training for research, but also through research. It prepares you for the future for many different careers if, in case you don't necessarily want to be a researcher. It definitely prepares you to do research, but through research, you get skills like um, critical thinking, decision making, problem solving, as well as presentation skills and analysis skills. You also get comfortable interacting with others through your research, through collaborations or through other means and working with others as well. So these are all, all, of, some, all of the skills that you will learn through the, the program that are not just, oh, on paper, you know, I have publications etc which you can also do within the ims so again research-based focus and ethics but also all of these extra skills transferable skills that will be important for any career you choose to do in the future so with the academic stream we have the master's program and requirements for this are a four years honors ba or bsc or an md from a recognized university we also have the option for a PhD program, and there are two ways to start in the PhD program. The first is with a previous master's. So if you've already done an MSc with a research based and defended thesis dissertation from a recognized university, this does not include course based masters, but there is the PhD direct entry program. So you don't need a previous master's degree, but you do need a four year honors bachelor's or an MD, as well as outstanding publications and outstanding research contributions. And that's how you can get in direct entry directly from your bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail into entry of the IMS. So it's based on academic achievements. As I mentioned, you know, research publications, grades, a CV, letters of reference, a letter of intent that you write, as well as a potential interview with a member of the admissions committee. So now I'm going to talk about each of these things in a little bit more detail. So again, you need the four year honors bachelor's or MD with a minimum A minus average in three out of four years. Now these three, one of these three has to be your final year. And that's because we want to see that you're prepared for graduate school through your bachelor's or MD training. Next letters of reference. These are crucial for your application and they must be from faculty members at a recognized academic institution. Ideally, again, going back to the ANA 498, if you do that, you would want a reference letter from your supervisor in, in a research lab. Ideally, we want to see um, references that know who you are as a person, as well as your research experience and who can speak to those things. So the research experience is really key for our program. Next, a letter of intent. This is where you write about your goals and aspirations, potential research interests, and supervisors you reached out to or you may be interested in working with, as well as any other information pertaining to your application. So in the letter of intent, for example, you didn't do too well in a couple of your courses or in one of your years in university, you can write that in your letter of intent, what, um, why that happened and how you have shown improvement in the future. So that's a great place to put extra things about you that are not necessarily shown on a transcript, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, an interview, you may be invited to, to attend an interview with a graduate faculty admissions committee member to discuss your application. Now, this can be done through Skype or Zoom or by telephone. And this is for students who may be on the fence or the applications admissions committee wants a little bit more information from you and this would be prior to receiving a decision about your application so an interview is not a must for everyone you may get your acceptance without an interview but that is another part of the application process and getting entry into the ims for some students so next i want to answer this common question we always get do i need to have a supervisor when i apply in short, the answer is no. Admission into the master's program is based on the merits of your applications. That being said, it is always good to start exploring opportunities with potential supervisors 
and it's never too early to start this process. So actually on our website now, there's a document posted with faculty looking for new students. So if you're applying for next September, for example, you can see what faculty are looking for students coming September. So that's a really great place to start. Now, if you are interested in the PhD program, or if you are an international student, you must have a supervisor in place when you apply. So again, go back to that document. That's really a great place to start and go from there. But the majority of our students in the master's program, domestic students, do not need a supervisor at that point. So I just want to mention the application deadline. So for September admission, the online application is due February 1st, as well as June 1st. And so the February 1st deadline is for early admissions. If you have all of your documentation and everything in by February 1st, you will be considered earlier than the June deadline and you will get an answer earlier so you can start to plan ahead of time. For international students, the online application is March 1st. Now for January admissions, we missed by a month the uh, October application, but that is important to keep in mind if you are looking ahead and if you'll be done your degree in the fall and want to start the following winter. So now this would be instead of January 2022, it would be January 2023. But it's fantastic that I, I definitely see some students who are very interested and in looking into this already. So these are key dates for the application. So now I just want to talk a little bit before ending about the student body and other aspects of the program. So we have IMSA. IMSA is the IMS, Institute of Medical Sciences Student Association. Now IMSA promotes a sense of community within IMS through diverse and engaging events. And even through the pandemic, they have been putting on so many different events. They um, have started with in-person meetings now, which is fantastic, but through the pandemic, there were, you know, um, esports tournaments and esports leagues. There was a ton of academic events. We actually this morning had an Ori Rothstein lectureship, um, which is named after one of our previous IMS directors, and that was an academic event that was put on by students. We had a fabulous keynote speaker and a panel of boundless career possibilities with different graduates of different degree programs talking about their experience and how they got into the career they're in now. We actually had Science Sam, if you know of Science Sam, the science communicator, she was on our panel. So it was a fantastic event this morning. So IMSA helps to put on these events as well as other aspects of the student body, social events, academic, esports, wellness. I was doing yoga last year with IMSA through my, through my Zoom screen, it was amazing. Also, we have the IMS magazine, which is a department guided student run publication. So everything from basic science to clinical research and current topics are discussed in the magazine. This is again student run. And so you can gain experience with scientific and medical writing through the IMS magazine, as well as you know, if you're a great photographer, if you're a great illustrator, we want you. So these are just some examples of the many things that the student body does outside of their research in the IMS. So with that, I'd like to thank you. We're happy to answer any questions. Again, Ms. Pollard is here, our admissions officer. You can check us out at ims.utoronto.ca. If you have any questions after the session, you can reach out to Ms. Pollard at adm.medscience.utoronto.ca. Thank you very much. I'm going to check the chat and the Q&A for questions. Before you check the chat, um, Michelle, one point of correction in terms of the deadline. The of deadline course. has been changed. It's now June 15. Okay. For September registration and October 15 for okay. January registration. And this is applicable to all applicants, both domestic and international. Amazing. Thank you so much. So you get even more time, even better. Yes. yes. So we have a question in the chat that says, can international students also apply for the early application deadline for February 1st? International applicants can apply as early as possible. And I would highly advise that international applicants apply early. Reason being that um, it takes time for the processing of the application. And secondly, once a decision is made, it also takes time for the applicant to apply for their study permit. It can take roughly three to four months um, for the application of the study permit. So the earlier an international applicant applies, 
is the better um, that person have the um, chance of an early response from us and applying for the study permit in time. Amazing, thank you very much. So we have um, a question in the Q&A. So this isn't an MD program. No, it is not, but we do have a lot of MDs part of our program and a lot of students who go through the program become MDs and go to med school after that. So I know quite a few people who have, you know, done their masters in the IMS and are now in med school. And so it is you get that research experience with a lot of um, which a lot of people want to get and also looks great on that application, but we are a research intensive program that is thesis based. So we have another question in the chat i'm doing my undergrad here at U of T, but I don't have PR yet, should I follow the domestic or the international deadlines. I will answer that question as a U of T um, student. Yes, you must follow the international until you get your PR status. However, concession will be given to you as a U of T student, whereby um, there's a possibility that you might be um, able to pay a domestic fee instead of the international fee. But once the application is accepted, we can further discuss this. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ms. Pollard. In the Q&A we have, is there a rotation system in the first year of the MSC program? We do not have a rotation system. Other programs do. Um, I do think that with the IMS, you know, you go in starting in September with your lab, but you can do your own, not quite rotation, but you can do your own um, research experience before the program, as well as speaking to supervisors. And that's definitely something we recommend. You wanna make sure you have a good fit with the supervisor and the lab before you go into that. So again, no rotation system, but you can definitely interview with labs. You really want to, when I, when I say interview in that, you want to see if you're interested in the lab, but also if you would enjoy spending your time there because it really is research focused and you spend a lot of time in the lab. I'm not sure if you can see, I'm in the lab right now. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely very research focused. Amazing. Is there predetermined waiting for specific components of the application or is it considered holistically? The application is um, considered once all documentation for the application is received. Incomplete applications we do not process. Perfect. And so in terms of the weighting, there's not really specific weighting on, on different components. We do look at the application as a whole. So if, for example, you you know, didn't do so well in one of your years and didn't get that A minus average, but you did in the other three years, that's considered okay. If you know you have tons of research experience and output, you know, you have, you have a bunch of publications and things that is, you know, that is considered as well compared to the grades. You do need to have relevant courses to what you want to study. If I was taking, you know, mostly English, French, Spanish, et cetera, courses, and I wanted to do cardiovascular research, that may not be looked at so highly, just because you want, we want to make sure that you have, you know, that experience and that course-based knowledge. So again, it is considered holistically, but it is key to keep in mind the aspects of what you wanna do. If you've done tons of neuroscience courses, neuroscience research, and you wanna continue with that, that's definitely a great place to start. So I was the one who asked if the MD program, could you repeat that? If it's not an MD program, what kind of master's or PhD degree do you get? So again, not an MD program. It is a master's in science. The PhD, there's no, there's no, I mean, there is technically, you know, a doctorate of science, but that isn't really a, a thing. It's usually just, you know, the doctorate of philosophy and as a whole, but we are focused on medical science. So if you were to do the master's program, it would be a master's of science, but there are also what's called collaborative specializations. And what these are is that if your research is in a specific area, again, for example, neuroscience, there's CPIN, which is the collaborative specialization in neuroscience, and that will be put on your degree as well, saying specialization in neuroscience. So it is science, but um, again, as I mentioned previously, you do have 
your, um, you do have your students who have done an MD before, and I mentioned that in the slides, and you also have students who do the masters or the PhD and go into medical school after. And so they have that research experience, they have that, you know, patient interaction in a different way or that basic science research. So the world is your oyster <laughs> with the program, definitely. Amazing, if you answered this already, how long is the master's program? So the master's program is approximately two years. So I, and I don't say four years, for example, um, as you mentioned in the question, it's not four years, it's about two years. Now, of course, there are extenuating circumstances with COVID. Your master's may be a little bit longer because people were, you know, not able to be in lab, for example, and things like this happen, or your research project isn't going as quickly as you would like, but it is mm -hmm. about two years of dedicated research time. Yes, yeah, so I'm going back to the chat for a second. For international students, we need to find our own source of funding before our application is considered. However, we need a letter of acceptance to receive funding from an agency or government. Is there something we can do to have our applications considered without funding? Okay, I will answer that. For IMS, um, our policy for international students, whether domestic or, um, sorry, whether master's or PhD, you, the applicant, is fully responsible for finding your own research supervision and funding. And for this reason, we encourage all our applicants, be it international or domestic, to contact our faculty members as early as possible for the purpose of research supervision and funding. Even our domestic students cannot register in the graduate program without research supervision and funding. So the onus is on you, the applicant, to secure your research supervision and funding. However, from time to time, the, our faculty members would contact me asking me if I know of a student who is looking for um, research supervision and funding. Any student that you know, contacted me, I would add their name to my list. And yes, I would pass it on to the faculty member who is looking for a student. However, most faculty members, depending on their funding situation, may not have enough in their budget to support an international student. And from time to time, they will take um, a domestic student. But again, it is your responsibility, whether you're international or domestic, to find your own research supervision and funding. Amazing. There's a thank you in the chat. Thank you, Ms. Pollard. I'm also going to add that our website has a whole faculty search tool. So you can look by research type. For example, I'm in cardiovascular, so I would look at cardiovascular, for example, and you can search for faculty members that do that type of research. So this is all on our website ims.utoronto.ca and you can look for faculty members and we have an extensive list of faculty members as I mentioned around 600 faculty members, so there is definitely some sort of research that you'll be interested in. So the next that is question. great I want to reiterate what Michelle just said about um, applicants securing the looking for a supervisor early. Um, at our website right now we have a list that says faculty members seeking students for January registration. However, um, I can clearly say that you have the um, right and opportunity to contact any of our faculty member, whether that person name appears on the list that is published about research supervision and funding. There are quite a number of our faculty members that do not advertise their intent. But again, please go ahead and contact any of our faculty whose research is of interest to you for research supervision and funding. Perfect, thank you. So the next question, once into the master's program, can you switch to a PhD program or do you have to reapply? So there is, it's called a transfer, it's a PhD transfer. And so you can start in the master's program if you're loving your research, if everything is going well, you can, you can transfer into the PhD program. What this means is you'll have a transfer exam so you have your committee, 
your program advisory committee or PAC, which is members that help you along your way in graduate school. And we didn't go into much detail about that here, but that's a very key part of grad life and of graduate school because it's not just your supervisors there to help you. You have a committee of faculty members there, as well as an external examiner um, and an internal examiner. And these people will be on your PhD transfer exam. And you need to, you know, defend your proposal. So it's like you're doing a mini defense in order to get into the PhD program. So that's one way of doing it. If you'd like to just finish with your master's, you can defend your master's and reapply either into the IMS or a different department for your PhD. So that there that transfer is definitely a possibility. There are lots of students who do it and they end up succeeding. So in that case, you do not end up with an MSc. You don't get that MSc, you get a PhD at the end of the day. And it's a longer time period, but you have a lot more time to do your research, which is great. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So just to clarify what was previously said, the September application deadline moved to June 15th for both domestic and international students. Just to clarify, Ms. Pollard. That is correct, yes. Perfect, thank you. So how is this program different from the physiology program? Well, there are certain differences and similarities to all of the programs. Our program has a lot more breadth and depth of research. We're not just um, within kind of the physiology, for example, although there are quite a few faculty that are cross appointed to both physiology and IMS. Also, our course requirements for the degree program are different. So in the IMS, you will have to take the MSc 1010 or 1011 course, which is a seminar course in one year. You have to attend the Ori Rothstein lecture, which I talked about was this morning for, for this year's students. You have to complete some modules, which are quarter credit courses. So for those at U of T, that would be smaller than you know a half year or a term course, as well as um, complete, you have to give a presentation and present at scientific day. So there's a lot of different components to that course as well as getting another full credit of courses. So again, we are a course light program. The physiology program, you have to take more courses. Um, definitely, because I have friends who are in, in the lab adjacent who take more courses in physiology. So that's one of the differences, but also the faculty members that we have. We have a lot more faculty members than the physiology department does. What do most master's grad students do after graduating? What career opportunities are there? Great question. So again, we have a lot of people, I'm just being cognizant of time, we have a lot of people who go on to doing their MD or going into other professional schools. So dentistry, um, I know a few who have gone to law school, so you can do the professional school route. After the master's, you can also go into a PhD or you can go into a lot of different areas um, of science. So you do have that scientific and research knowledge. So you can go into industry, which I mean by that, you know, pharmaceutical or biotechnology and Toronto has um, has a big startup area, J Johnson and Johnson or J labs downtown in the Mars building has a ton of startups. So there are quite a few opportunities after graduate school, and especially in science, it seems these days, it's very hard to get a job with just a bachelor's, unfortunately, but you do gain those transferable skills, as I mentioned. So, um, ed or training through research as well as for research. Hopefully that answers your question. If students want to be a medical researcher, but not a front end doctor, where should they look into? So this program is fantastic for that. The IMS, the medical science research gives you that opportunity to be a medical researcher. I work out of St. Michael's Hospital doing medical research, we get we use um, umbilical cells. So I get those from the hospital, I walk across the bridge and I get the cells we use from the hospital. So it's very much medical research and it's hospital adjacent, no joke, because I walk across a bridge that's connecting the hospital. <laughs> so this whole bench to bedside thing is, is a reality in, for me. Hopefully that helps to answer your question a little bit. But again, you can do clinical research as well. So I do basic research. You can do clinical research as well. And that's very much dealing with patients and you know, if it's neuroscience, cognition, et cetera, that is another way to do it with medical research. What is the advantage of applying to the early deadline? Ms. Pollard, do you want to answer this one? 
Sure. The advantages of applying to the early deadline, one, you get an early response to your application. Two, you get an opportunity to apply for any initiatives either the department or the university itself is providing to incoming students for the registration period that you apply to. Amazing. Yes, so that there's a ton of scholarships that you can apply for. And if you've gotten that early admissions, you can start that early. That is correct. Great. I would have to cut you short um, Perfect. for physiology up next. Amazing. Um, okay. Okay, well, we just want to thank the participants for visiting with us today. Thank you. Amazing. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much, Michelle and Hazel. Yeah. Mish, I'll email you. Perfect. Just trying to give Eva, I'm going to stop recording.